I'm sitting here at the Solidaritets head office and uh, with me is uh, the general manager, Dr. Dirk Herman. And Solidaritet is it's one of the country's oldest trade unions. Yeah, we were established in 1902, quite an old trade union. But uh, through the years, we also transformed ourselves in a whole community movement. So although the trade union is still the core of the bigger solidarity movement, in the movement we have now also training institutions, um, media institutions, a civil rights um, organization, um, and then also a social leg. So we are quite broad now um, in um, um, operating broadly within um, the Afrikaans minority community. And uh, why was this uh, transformation necessary? We all realized after 1994 the minorities in South Africa um, will be in a weak position and uh, we sit in a situation in South Africa where we have a majority ideology. Um, we have a very strong socialist um, government that believes that good and power must be centralized. And that put the minority in a very difficult position. And minorities must take self-responsibility. And we've realized that we need institutions um, through which the Afrikaans community then can live in South Africa. And so we if, um, established as a whole series of community institutions so that we can um, live as a community within a majority environment. Uh, me being from Sweden, uh, we have a tradition of that our unions are very far left. Where, where do you find yourself on the scale of ideology? There's a tradition um, in um, the world um, of Christian trade unionism. So there's two um, different schools of trade union thinkings. The one is the classical socialist trade union movement. They are more left. And then there's the Christian tradition of trade, trade union um, um, movement and economically more right and um, more free market orientated. We are in that tradition of trade union. We believe in less government, in more community, more self-responsibility. And uh, um, so um, we actually uh, that stand in the, on the opposite opposite side of the left socialist trade union movement. So the collision with your ideology with the South African state, is it, is it based on these free market principles? Uh, it's not only free market principles, definitely the free market principles as well. Um, we believe that you grow the economy through a free market and um, that's good for all. Um, but it's more than that. That is also a, a very strong um, federalistic approach that we have where decision making must be uh, made on the lowest level possible. So we thus believe that freedom is freedom that you as a community can choose how you want um, to live with, within a country. We believe you are not free if the government from a central point of view determine how you must live, how you must think and what you must do. Because um, the South African government and the ANC works very hard with uh, equality of outcome. And how does that affect your, your members in your union? The ANC's core ideology is the idea of um, equality, but then you must then define that because you are quite correct, it's equality of outcome. And um, now, they, the instrument that they use to do that is the instrument that they call the, um, uh, representativity. And that means that all institutions in South Africa must be an exact replica of the South African community. So um, that's a very mechanistic um, approach um, to society. We think it's a form of social engineering where you say that everything must reflect the country's um, demographics, racial demographics. And then um, from their point of view, if something on a level does not reflect the country's um, uh, demographics, then it's not equal. So the, it's absolutely an, um, um, an ideology of equal outcomes and they measure that against representativity. And then they use affirmative action or corrective measures then to um, make sure that South Africa is an exact replica of its composition on every level. And suddenly it's not um, input that matter, but it's output that matter. So they will then measure everything and if you apply for a specific job, then they will measure your application against that specific job levels 
representative, uh, representativity of the country's demographics. Now, that becomes absurd. And, of course, it has a tremendous influence, influence on a minority community because the fact is that South Africa's affirmative action process is um, that's focused on a majority. And those that's included in these affirmative action processes, of course, is 90% of the country. 10% is not included. So that's the only place in the world that 10% must thus affirm 90%. It's barely impossible. And the result of that is that minorities is thus in a very, very difficult position. If you apply in the Americas, um, the affirmative action is minority instruments. In South Africa, it's a majority instrument measured against the uh, racial demographics of South Africa. And that put us in a very difficult position. Yeah, that, that's quite shocking to hear. Uh, but uh, what we hear in Sweden is that those political reforms of affirmative action is to adjust the previously disadvantaged, the previously unjustice yeah. that were in this country during it, apartheid it, time. It has nothing in practice to do with that. Um, it is, um, if it was about injustices, then the answer is training and development to actually empower someone to enter the labor market. In this specific case, it's a mathematical measure yardstick that they use. So it's all about race and not disadvantagement. The and measure uh, is... How, how does this separate from apartheid? Because uh, what we hear in Sweden is that apartheid was based on racial categories. The categories that they use to determine the racial composition in workplaces is exactly the same categories that was used in the apartheid era. It is silos that's created According, according to racial categories. Solidarity was at the United Nations, at CERT, um, that's the uh, Committee for the Eradication of All Forms of Racial Discriminations. We laid a um, complaint against the South African government and the outcome of that was CERT that wrote in the report to the government saying that they have a real concern about the South African government using apartheid categories still in a post-apartheid era because they actually thus um, um, use the apartheid categories and through that they racialize the South African society. The um, international best practice say that you must look at a person's um, specific situation and rather use um, class than race. So South Africa actually develop a racial program that has everything to do with race and very little to do with correction. You said that you have brought this up to the United Nations and uh, during apartheid time the international community stood uh, against these laws quite fiercely with sanctions and uh, didn't allow you to compete in sport. What kind of support do you see from the international community today? Our um, concern at this stage is that the international community stood up for certain principles to establish a post-South Africa um, um, era. But what we don't see at this stage is where's the international com uh, community to make sure that those principles that they actually fought for are still implemented in the post-South African time. Suddenly, we've got silence. In fact, the international community has a real concern to kill the legacy of Mandela. They still believe that South Africa is this country that um, is an example for the rest of the world, and it was so. There was this time of reconciliation, and their big fear is to kill that legacy. But the fact of the matter is, on the ground, that legacy has been killed by only the ANC. Um, they are establishing new racial parameters in South Africa and um, the question is how do we deal with that? Sasol is one of the biggest petrochemical companies in South Africa with the international um, branches um, in several countries. They've decided now on what they call an employee ownership scheme. That means 
that um, um, employees get shares within the company. And they've decided now that the employees that can uh, be, uh, benefit from that specific scheme can only be black employees. And that's ordinary workers, blue collar workers yeah. on the lowest level. So suddenly you will see <clears throat> in June this year, two workers, blue collar workers on the lowest level in Sasol. The one will get 500,000 rand of value in the form of shares. And the second guy will get nothing. And the reason for that is the difference in the color of their skin. That's, that is hard racism. And that is those kind of things that we must address and fight against. And we expect actually from the international community to be just as strong against this kind of racial practices than there was in the previous, um, of the pre-apartheid era. Because uh, what we heard from the international community was the Australian minister lifting the question, not because of racial discrimination, but because of the racial hatred in crimes in the Plas Morde. Have, have you, is there any minister out there in a foreign country that is actually talking about the domestic politics being in place? The thing is that um, the international community had no problem to speak out on domestic issues in South Africa in the pre-94 um, era. And the question is, where is that now? There's silence. We see Minister Dutton um, um, of Australia um, speaking out against violence. And the reason why he did that uh, was not because he's a racist. <laughs> that was because he listened to what was said in Parliament when there was a decision to expropriate um, land in South Africa without compensation. And in that specific debate, um, the parliamentaries, uh, parliamentarians in South Africa said, for example, that whites in South Africa must be thankful for the fact that they are still alive. In other countries, the minorities ran away and it was applauded. That is what was said. It was, um, they, in that debate, they criminalized the white community in South Africa. Dutton in Australia heard that. He just reflected on what was said. And that is my question um, <clears throat> um, and my request for the international world. Just listen what is said and then reflect on that. It's not even, um, uh, uh, but it, at this stage, there's a denial of what happens in South Africa and what is said um, in South Africa. Yeah, can, can you tell us a little bit what is the effect of this uh, political reforms of the affirmative actions on the black economic empowerment? Because I know that you also have an aid organization, the Help on the Hand. Yes. It um, puts the minority in a position that they have difficulties to enter the labor market. Um, and then we call it also underemployment, mean, meaning that the person will get a job but it's underemployed, not on the level that he's supposed to get that specific yeah. job. We see the, uh, there's an increase in poverty um, among the um, white community and the Afrikaner community, and we have a social leg that helped that, that to support that, a big social leg, the Solidarity Helping Hand, to um, support those specific um, um, individuals. But the problem here is not only on the individual side, the problem is also of the effect of the macroeconomy of South Africa. Because the moment that you have the strict interventions into an economy through legislation, then you create investor uncertainty. Because suddenly if you invest in South Africa, you are obliged to have a specific percentage of a specific race group in employment but also in ownership. Um, and that is actually a form of attack on private ownership. Because so, so as a white man in South Africa, you're not allowed to own your business 100% by yourself? No, you are obliged to bring someone in from another racial group. The absurdity of that is even in a family kind of business, you are suddenly 
um, um, forced to bring a certain percentage of ownership in from the majority community, ironically. And, um, and that has an influence on, um, of course, in the way that you do business. Um, you, you've, you, you, you lose actually a part of your ownership and um, private ownership are through that and the threat. And, um, and, and that leads to instability in the bigger South African environment. If you don't do that, then you um, are not entitled to have any governmental contracts and you uh, can't have contract with any, actually any big business in South other big business in South Africa because there's a net of black economic empowerment. You get certain percentages and if you don't have an X percentage, you can't, can't do business. And if you do business with someone that doesn't have a specific percentage um, of uh, points, then um, you, um, um, you don't get points. And, uh, and then you can't. So it's a net, a racial net that they actually put around the South African economy with the effect on individuals, but I think on the bigger South African economy. And then the irony of that is the people that pay the biggest price of less economy are the poorest of the poor and the majority of them are still black South Africans. Yeah. So, for, so for a white man to run a business for himself, he needs to do it on a very, very small scale. You have to do it on a very... If you have a specific percentage of, um, um, of rand value of um, turnover, then you must bring in other um, owners as well. And uh, you, of course, as a trade union, represent your members. Have you had any success in court cases against the government uh, fighting for the workers' rights? We have. We, we, um, at this stage, we have 32 different court cases on racial discrimination against the South African government. Um, and that's big. So we have a lot of big cases. The problem just is that um, the legal um, uh, environment um, is not separated, separated from political ideology. If you have this big majority political ideology, the courts follow. Yeah. So you have very little maneuver in the South African courts if the political ideology is a strong racial ideology. And, um, and that's the difficulty, that you, difficulty that, that you have. If you have a racial political ideology, the courts follow. And uh, now, in, uh, is it this summer? or winter here in South Africa, that you will uh, bring up a case to the United Nations together with the AFRI Forum. That's correct, yes. We brought a case to the United Nations, specifically to CERT, and that specific case um, um, was based on um, racial quotas, the use of racial quotas. Racial quotas in the workplace and racial quotas in, the, in, in sport. Now, racial quotas in the workplace, we say that's against the United Nations and the International Labour Organization's prescriptions on affirmative action um, because it creates separate silos for sub separate uh, uh, different racial groups and that's against the international norms. So we brought that and we also brought the whole issue of racial quotas in sport. That's absolute absurdity because sport teams are obliged to have a specific percentage of um, race groups within the sport groups. The ironic here is that um, um, the end goal is that every um, sport team in South Africa must reflect the racial composition of the country. Now that's absolutely absurd. Let's take, for example, America. Um, the basketball teams are by far um, dominated by the minority black communities, but the whole of America are loyal to those specific groups. Can you think, if you bring a, um, a, a law in America stating that baseball teams must be um, reflective of the um, uh, American composition, you will see an uproar. Yeah. So now we sit in a situation where we must compete internationally and we can't choose our best teams, we must choose teams based on race.
So when are you presenting this to the United Nations? We've already presented uh, that to the United Nations. And the United Nations um, um, wrote back in a report asking for explanations from the South African government. For instance, they asked the um, um, South African government to explain why they still use the um, um, racial categories. And they also asked the government to explain what the effect of that is on the South African economy. And South Africa must give feedback now back to CERT um, at their next sitting. And when is the next sitting? Uh, it's only 2020. Okay, okay so it's yeah. closing up. Yes. Yeah. That will be very exciting to follow and see what And the, the so reason why it's so long time, because government, of course, must bring in changes, etc. So they said very, we, we already started now to put government on terms um, in the build up to 2020. Ah, yeah, no, um, yeah, 2020, sorry, yeah, yeah. 2020, yeah, yeah. All right, that will be very exciting to see. Yeah. F thank you very much for, for having us. You're more than welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate it.